If she'd known it would be so simple, she would have done it ages ago. She couldn't believe she'd waited this long to go to try. Madeline stretched lazily in her lover's bed, rolling onto her right side. She got up, wandered into the bathroom, and turned on the shower, adjusting the temperature before sipping in. Just as she was about to turn off the water, Nicholas entered the room, so she stepped out and let him take her place. Twenty minutes later, they were both ready for the day. Nicholas leaned in for a kiss, but Madeline pulled back slightly, not wanting to smudge her freshly applied lipstick. Calm down, my love. Stick to the plan, and then we can indulge, she reminded him gently. I'm sorry, you're right, he said. It's just that your lips are irresistible. She smiled brightly, feeling content, at least for now. This chapter of her life was unfolding just as she'd envisioned. She expected nothing less and hoped it would last much longer. Some might call what she and Nicholas had an affair, but to Madeline that term felt too harsh. She loved Nicholas and saw their Wednesday meetings as something far more meaningful. Madeline Kennedy hadn't been searching for love when she found it again. Madeline had been happily married to Brian Kennedy for 13 years when, three months ago, she met Nicholas Gibbs at an executive board meeting at Parkfield Hospital. As the HR director at Parkfield, she often attended such meetings, but Nicholas, the new marketing representative at Corn Black, the hospital's public relations firm, stood out immediately. He was dressed in a charcoal grey striped suit that accentuated his athletic build. Standing 1.91 meters tall, and weighing 101 kilograms. His wavy, thick brown hair and flashing big brown eyes captivated her whenever he spoke. Every time Nicholas looked at her, a thrilling sensation surged through her, making her realize over the next few months that her feelings for him were far deeper than mere attraction. This wasn't just an affair, it was a profound connection, something she refused to feel guilty about. One Saturday afternoon, Brian Kennedy went to check the mailbox, gathering a handful of letters and various pieces of correspondence. Among them were two envelopes from the state of Indiana, containing license plate stickers and printed registration documents for 2023. Brian tore open his envelope, placed the new sticker on his license plate, and stored the registration in his car's glove compartment. When he opened the envelope addressed to Madeline, he tried to place her registration in her glove compartment, but found it locked. Who locks their glove compartment? Brian thought, irritated. He fetched his wife's car keys from the shelf, unlocked the glove compartment, and put the new registration inside. Just as he was about to close it, a sudden wild thought struck him. Brian opened the glove compartment again and peered inside. He found the car's operating manual, the last three registrations, and a cell phone. The sight of the phone startled him. Dan, he muttered to himself, feeling a sense of unease creeping in. Brian knew his wife was upstairs in the shower, just as she had been every Saturday for the past six months. She had returned home about 20 minutes earlier from her morning workout, and as usual, went straight to the shower. He slowly turned on the phone he had found in her glove compartment, waiting for it to fully load before checking the call history. Since she hadn't expected anyone to find her phone, the call history wasn't cleared. There was a short list of calls, but a long list of text messages, all from someone named Gibbs. Even before he read the texts, Brian realized that his 13-year marriage was over. The messages only confirmed his worst fears. Brian turned off the phone, put it back in the glove compartment, and locked it again. He hung his wife's keys back on the hook and paused for a moment, listening to the sound of the shower still running upstairs. He then went outside to mow the yard, trying to process everything. The messages revealed that Madeline had been having an affair with Nicholas Gibbs for almost a year. Brian recalled that it was around this time that her late Wednesday nights at the office began. It appeared she took a long lunch break and extended her workday to make time for her meetings with Nicholas. About six months ago, according to the correspondence, they had added Saturday mornings to their trysts. Brian remembered that this coincided with the start of his wife's classes at the local gym. Tears welled up in his eyes and he slapped the handle of the lawn mower with both hands in frustration. From the bedroom on the second floor, Madeline smiled 
when she heard the sound of the mower. She knew that Brian enjoyed mowing the yard, both for the exercise and because he genuinely loved the look of a well-kept lawn. As she got dressed, ready to enjoy the rest of her Saturday, she felt incredibly fortunate. She had an adoring husband and a passionate young lover. For almost a year, Madeleine had expanded her love life to include Nicholas, and everything was going exactly as planned. Thanks to meticulous planning and organization, her life had never been so complete. A loving husband, two wonderful children, a great job, and a 30-year-old lover who filled the emotional and physical gaps she had perceived in her marriage. Yes, there were moments of near despair, but mostly she felt she was living life to the fullest by embracing a second love. In her eyes, she had achieved everything she wanted in life. She hadn't taken the easy way out. She had chosen to live fully. On that day, living fully meant being able to make love to two different men. After making love with Nicholas, Madeleine always took a thorough shammer, ensuring there was no trace of her earlier intimacy if Brian initiated lovemaking later that evening. In fact, the thrill of her secret often led her to initiate it herself, reveling in the additional excitement from her own mischief. Madeline and Nicholas's relationship was truly about love, not just lust. The young man was warm, intelligent, and his interests differed from those of her husband, adding a new dimension to her life. Nicholas knew from the beginning that she was married and loved her husband, but Madeline believed she had enough love to include Nicholas in her heart as well. Nicholas, 12 years younger than her husband, was strong-willed and physically robust, with abs and about 15 kilograms of additional muscle. That Saturday, however, Madeline didn't get to make love to both men's plans. Brian, citing fatigue, slipped away that evening. She had to admit, he looked out of sorts when he came in after mowing the lawn. In fact, he was just relieved he didn't throw up when she tried to initiate something. Lying next to Madeline, he reflected on how many times she might have given him mere seconds of her attention. Brian, the vice president of finance at a medium-sized tool and dye manufacturing company, started his day at 7.10 each morning. He'd make a coffee, then sift through his emails. The plant officially began work at 8 o'clock. At 8.13 a.m., he walked into the office of his friend, Dustin Chambers, the production supervisor who had divorced his wife for 14 years, four years ago. Do you have a few minutes for something personal? Brian asked. When Dustin nodded, Brian stepped in and closed the door behind him. This can't be good, Dustin thought. Seven minutes later, Dustin had heard the whole story from Brian and immediately called his divorce lawyer, an old college friend. Dustin's friend arranged to see Brian that same day, fitting him into the schedule. Madeline was shocked when she was served divorce papers at the hospital the following Wednesday, right after returning from her date with Nicholas. She had no idea her husband was unhappy in their marriage and completely missed the irony of the timely delivery of the documents. While she tried to piece it all together, it never crossed her mind that Brian had discovered her relationship with Nicholas. As soon as she calmed down enough, Madeline called her husband, her voice trembling with tears. Why? What is this? What did I do wrong? She pleaded. Really? Are you still asking? Brian replied, his voice tinged with incredulity. You've been having an affair for about a year now, and you still can't figure out why I'm divorcing you. Madeleine was stunned for the second time in a few minutes. She continued to sob, but had no words for Brian, and he ended the conversation as he expected. That evening, instead of staying late at work as usual, Madeline was waiting for him at home. Will Mr. McCoy be upset with you for not making up the hours for that long lunch? Brian asked as he entered the house from the garage. I love you, honey, Madeline said, her voice breaking. I'm sorry I didn't tell you about Nicholas, but I thought it would be better for everyone. For everyone, you and your lover aren't everything. What about me? Am I not part of everyone? Brian shot back. Yes. You are part of it, she said softly, her guilt and regret evident. I guess I need to explain, Madeline began. You think I didn't tell you about Nicholas because I knew you wouldn't understand, and you've ruined everything, like you're doing now. Am I ruining everything? I'm so sorry. What exactly am I spoiling? Brian growled. 
I wasn't looking for this relationship, Brian. It just happened, and I'm glad it did. Nicholas is a wonderful man. You'd like him if you got to know him better, she said. This is much more than an affair. I love him as much as I love you, Brian, and I can't give him up any more than I can give you up. But we're married. You can't love two men at the same time, Brian objected. No, I can, Madeleine insisted. Marriage doesn't mean you can automatically turn off your emotions, turn off love. You are my first love, he's my second. I'm capable of loving multiple people at the same time. It's not a matter of choosing one over the other. Madeline Nicholas understands that I already have a full life. He's willing to be content with the little time I can give him. You and the family get the lion's share of my time, as it should be. I haven't taken anything away from you and the children. I just added something for myself. Nicholas is not your husband. He is an intruder. He should be grateful for any time he gets from you. But I'm your husband, and you have two children. All your time should be given to us, Brian countered. I love my life the way it is now, and I don't want to change anything. I need you all, Madeline said. I didn't want to get divorced. Yes, but I also didn't want my wife to sleep with another man. Apparently, we don't always get everything we want, Ryan said bitterly. Do you remember the vows to love, honor, and cherish? That's how you talk about it. It's dirty, disgusting, Madeline retorted. From your point of view, but maybe from mine it definitely is, Brian replied. You, she growled in frustration. The argument came to an abrupt halt when their two children came downstairs to greet their father. Both parents knew their children had overheard the heated conversation. Dominic, 12, and Matilda, 9, looked uneasy and confused. I'm sorry you had to hear that, Brian said gently. In the future, we'll try to behave more like adults. But yes, we're getting divorced. We both still love you, and you had nothing to do with our breakup. Madeleine quickly added, I agree with everything your father said, except that there won't be a divorce. He won't be so selfish as to ruin your lives because something happened to him. He's not ruining your life. He's reacting to it, Brian interjected. Mom, did you cheat on Dad? How could you? Matilda screamed, her face flushed with anger and confusion. Madeline grimaced, looking first at her daughter and then at her husband. Watch your mouth, Matilda. I'm still your mother, Madeline rasped. Only because I can't divorce you. The girl shouted back before running upstairs to her room. Well, that was pleasant. Brian muttered to no one in particular. I think we need to have a family meeting while we're eating. Dominic, bring your sister so we can talk. Madeline sat there, feeling the weight of her actions as she looked at the other three members of her family. They openly discussed her infidelity and the impending divorce, a situation she had never imagined facing. He told the children that he was applying for joint custody, refusing to let Madeline take sole custody. You can't take the kids away from me, Brian, she screamed. And I'm not going to, but you won't get primary custody either. You can't cheat on me and expect me to be a father just for the weekends, he snapped back. So, who is the guy you're cheating on dad with? Dominic asked, looking straight at his mother. This is hardly appropriate, young man, Madeline began. I think it's very appropriate, Brian interjected. The kids are old enough to hear the truth, no matter what you want. He spent a few minutes telling the children everything he had learned about Nicholas Gibbs over the past week. Madeline was stunned by how much her husband knew about her lover. Brian had already developed a knack for surprising her, and he didn't shy away from revealing all he had discovered to their children. Madeline spent most of this part of the conversation looking down at her plate. There will be no divorce, children. I just need to get your father to see things my way, she said, taking her empty plate and glass and walking into the kitchen. Both children looked at Brian, who just shrugged his shoulders. They both knew their father well enough to understand that he wasn't the kind of man who would tolerate a cheating wife. After finishing dinner, the children headed to their rooms, but not before Dominic said, We're here if you need us, Dad. We'll talk, but we don't want to get caught in the crossfire, if you know what I mean. Thanks guys, I appreciate that. 
Brian replied. After dinner, the family usually gathered in the common room to watch a movie or several TV shows, unless the children were busy with homework. Madeline sat in the living room, ostensibly reading a book. When Brian went to the common room to watch his favorite gang show, he smiled to himself as he settled in, knowing that Madeline hadn't picked up a book in months. Sitting in the living room, Madeline fought back tears, occasionally turning a page to maintain the illusion of reading. Just five hours ago, she believed she had the perfect life. Now, she realized her marriage was hanging by a thread, and her ideal life would unravel if she couldn't make Brian understand what she wanted, what she needed. Brian had exposed her relationship with Nicholas as something vulgar and base, but to Madeline, it was anything but. Her husband was a good man, maybe even wonderful, but he wasn't without flaws, without weaknesses. Nicholas's presence in her life filled those gaps, and their intimacy was an expression of love, not just lust. Mostly, she had to admit, she hid her relationship with Nicholas because she knew her husband would never accept it. Now that he had found out it looked so wrong, Madeleine thought she had meticulously planned every detail to keep her relationship with Nicholas a secret. But now, she saw how fragile her plans really were. She meticulously accounted for every detail, ensuring that their lives remained nearly unchanged despite Nicholas's presence, neither increasing nor decreasing the frequency or intensity of their intimacy. She racked her brain, trying to understand how her clueless husband had suddenly caught on. Until just a few hours ago, Madeleine had considered herself the savvier spouse, having successfully concealed her relationship with Nicholas for almost a year. She couldn't deny that the first time Brian had enjoyed her body, just a few hours after Nicholas had stirred her more deeply than ever before, she felt his dominance keenly. Nicholas appeared content with the state of their relationship, despite the 12-year age gap. Madeleine possessed the physique of a much younger woman, with a beautiful face, intelligence and charm. Nicholas was astonished at how quickly he had seduced this seemingly happily married woman. Madeleine made it clear that she wasn't just seeking physical intimacy. She wasn't looking to replace her husband. Nicholas found this arrangement more than acceptable, relishing the freedom of a bachelor. His only request was to add a second day to their weekly rendezvous. Initially, Madeleine hesitated, but a month later, she eagerly agreed, marking the start of her Saturday escapades. During one of their clandestine lunches at a distant restaurant, Nicholas pretended to sympathize with Madeleine's predicaments. Honestly, Madeleine, if you end up getting divorced, it'll give us more time together. It's not so bad for me, he remarked between bites of his sandwich. But I know you don't want a divorce. Do we really have to end things? I hope not. Brian has always been reasonable, and I believe he still loves me, she replied, her heart heavy with uncertainty. So if I can appeal to his sense of justice, I'll be able to get him to see things my way, Madeline said, her voice tinged with hope. If I had a choice, I wouldn't give up any part of you. Nicholas cut in, his words filled with longing. Why should your husband? Because he loves me, and I just need to make him understand that maintaining the status quo makes me happy, and it doesn't diminish our love for each other, she explained, her turn pleading. But until I can convince him, I think we need to tread lightly. It would only hurt our case if I appeared to be forcing the issue, she added, her voice heavy with apprehension. Brian wasn't surprised when Madeline didn't show up for her Saturday morning workout. He knew she was wise enough to step back, at least visually, from her relationship with Nicholas. However, he just needed to prod her to gauge her reaction. You might as well go to your lover right now, baby. I've already filed for divorce, and I'm not going to change my mind. Brian declared, the tension palpable as they sat in the common room while their children played outside. Just because you file doesn't mean you can't change your mind, honey, Madeline countered, her voice trembling with emotion. Do you love me, Brian, and the children more or less than me? What is it? She asked, her words rushing out in a desperate plea. Madeline caught him off guard, and she could see the wheels turning in his head as he searched for the right words. I love you all the same, but in different ways. You know that. What are you getting at? Brian replied, his voice strained. The fact that people can love many others on different levels, both unique 
and identical, simultaneously, she explained earnestly. I love you, Brian, and I need you as my husband and the father of my children. You have most of my time. But I also love Nicholas in a different yet equally profound way. Since he's not a member of our family, he has to make do with less of my time. Though he yearned for more, he reluctantly embraced his role. If you truly loved me as much as you claim, Brian implored, you would graciously accept your primary role and find happiness both for yourself and for me. But you stubbornly refuse to acknowledge the truth. Nicholas is not a part of our family, so he cannot be loved to the same extent as our children and I. He shouldn't have a minority role in our family structure. Family is what we define, Madeline countered. I want to include him in ours. I've been a devoted wife and mother. Surely, you can grant me this small request if you love me as deeply as you profess. I cannot and will not allow you to seek love outside of our family. And for your information, my love for you has diminished over the past two weeks due to your blatant disregard for me. You've undermined my reserves of love, Brian admitted, his voice heavy with sorrow. I haven't been disrespectful to you. My love for you remains as strong as ever, he insisted. If that were true, you wouldn't have taken a lover, Madeline retorted. Nicholas is more than just a lover. He's like a second husband. Yes, a younger husband, she added bitterly. Brian spent each night on the couch in the common room, despite Madeline's persistent pleas for him to return to their bedroom. We can't have a real conversation unless we're in the same bedroom at night, she argued. Madeline's eyes widened in disbelief at their first meeting with the lawyers when Brian's attorney suggested selling the house and dividing the property. You can't be serious. I don't want a divorce, she protested. Well, it's happening, so you'd better get used to it. We need to sell the house so we can both afford something bigger than a closet, Brian responded coldly. Fine, you win. Madeline practically screamed. I'll leave him. But I won't believe your promises. You had no qualms breaking our vows. Why should I trust your promises now? You'll just find a way to cheat again without me catching you. Brian accused, his voice laced with frustration. It's not about winning, you foolish woman. I've lost, and so have our children, he added bitterly, causing Madeline to bow her head in shame. And if I let you have your way, will we be even? She asked, her voice filled with desperation. You just don't understand, Brian. I want to, Madeline pleaded. Maybe, I just wanted it to be you and me. Brian felt a sense of unease when his in-laws called a week later, questioning why they were divorcing their daughter. He had always gotten along well with Madeline's parents, addressing them as mom and dad just like his own. I'm truly sorry, guys, he began. I didn't call because I thought Madeline would tell you. You know what they say about assuming, he explained, feeling a pang of guilt. Brian's father-in-law gasped in disbelief when Brian revealed that their daughter was cheating on him with Nicholas Gibbs. Are you sure, son? That doesn't sound like my girl, Peter Marshall exclaimed breathlessly. Well, it's not exactly cheating, Peter. She loves them both, and she doesn't want to get divorced, Brian clarified, trying to make sense of the complicated situation. Grace Marshall's and Peter's mouths hung open in shock, their disbelief evident. What in the world is happening here, Grace? Peter demanded, his tone incredulous. What do you know about this? Nicholas is a good guy, Peter. You would have liked him. Madeline doesn't cheat. She loves them both, Grace interjected, trying to calm the escalating tension. What on earth are you talking about? Grace demanded, her confusion mounting. Grace, you need to explain everything quickly and clearly, or we're headed for a second divorce. Peter urged, his voice tinged with concern. Peter, Brian's father-in-law, revealed that Brian's mother-in-law was aware of Madeline's affairs, but justified them as not cheating, because Madeline loves both men. It's not cheating, it's polyamory, Grace asserted confidently. Brian, feeling betrayed and left out of the loop, questioned why he wasn't informed about these arrangements. If it's polyamory, then why am I left out? Why wasn't I included in these plans? He demanded, his voice tinged with hurt. Well, apparently you and Dad knew she was cheating on Brian, and yet you didn't say anything to me. I deserve to know, Brian expressed, 
a mix of frustration and disappointment evident in his tone. I'm sorry, son. Nicholas is a good guy, Brian. You'll see it once you get to know him, Peter defended, attempting to ease the tension. Will you even bother to get acquainted? I have no desire to meet my daughter's boyfriend. A decent guy wouldn't engage in a relationship with a married woman, Grace countered, her tone firm yet defensive. Thanks for understanding, Dad, Brian replied, his voice heavy with resignation. Nicholas, on the other hand, suppressed his personal jubilation at the end of his divorce from Madeline. He appeared concerned outwardly, but inwardly he was bursting with excitement after a year of longing to spend more time with his beloved. He would now have the opportunity to spend time with Madeline every other week, as she and Brian would alternate custody of their children. Madeline, attempting to resist her feelings for Nicholas, initially refrained from seeing him. However, after a week of tears during Brian's custody of the children, she found herself yearning to spend time with Nicholas. On the first Monday when Brian had custody, Madeline stayed the night with Nicholas. He prepared a special dinner and dessert, ordering from their favorite Italian restaurant, creating a romantic evening for them to cherish. Wow, candles and all, that's incredibly thoughtful, Nicholas, Madeline exclaimed, her heart fluttering with appreciation. Nicholas had gone to great lengths to create a romantic ambience, something Madeline found herself deeply enjoying. A girl could easily get accustomed to being treated like this. Throughout dinner, Nicholas played Madeline's favorite classical music, a stark contrast to her ex-husband's preference for classic rock. Madeline couldn't help but smile broadly at Nicholas, feeling a sense of connection through their shared love for such refined melodies. Her smile widened even further as Nicholas, after dinner, rose from the table and whisked her into a slow dance to the enchanting compositions for the room. They moved gracefully together, lost in each other's arms, savoring the moment of intimacy. Afterwards, they retreated to Nicholas's bedroom, where their passion ignited and intensified with each passing moment. As they made love, Madeline couldn't help but entertain the thought that perhaps divorce wouldn't be as daunting as she once feared. The next morning, as they lay entwined in each other's embrace, Madeline realized the passing of time. Oh no, I'm going to be late if I don't hurry, she exclaimed, the reality of the day dawning on her. Let's save time by showering together. Nicholas suggested with a playful raise at his eyebrows. It definitely won't save time, but I promise to be quick. Madeline replied with a soft chuckle, relishing in their shared intimacy. On Friday evening, they found themselves dining out together for the first time in public. Madeline, adorned in a striking red dress she had specially chosen for the occasion, felt a surge of confidence as Nicholas admired her. You look absolutely stunning, my dear, Nicholas remarked, his words stirring a sense of pride within her. Throughout the evening, Madeline noticed the admiring glances directed their way, a testament to their undeniable chemistry and the allure of their companionship. Physically drained, Madeleine left Nicholas's house late on Sunday evening to retrieve her children from Brian's. Over the weekend, she and Nicholas had engaged in passionate lovemaking, culminating in multiple encounters each day. The vitality of her 30-year-old partner proved more demanding than Madeleine had anticipated, leaving her exhausted or fulfilled. A month later, as she made her way back to the car after picking up the children, a sense of satisfaction mingled with an underlying unease. It seemed that with each passing moment spent with Nicholas, their relationship deepened yet became more emotionally tumultuous. Absent-mindedly rubbing her wrist, she recalled the scratch from when Nicholas had introduced handcuffs into their intimacy, a novel experience for her. Though initially hesitant, she acquiesced to Nicholas's desires, the encounter leaving her feeling both exhilarated and apprehensive. Reflecting on the experience, she acknowledged the stark contrast between Nicholas's approach and Brian's, recognizing a shift in dynamics that both thrilled and unsettled her. Despite the children's awareness of Nicholas's presence, Madeline maintained a discreet distance, limiting their interactions to sporadic calls during work hours. She hadn't yet introduced her second love to her children, hesitant to disrupt their familiar routines. Concern gnawed at her when Nicholas failed to answer her calls on Wednesday, his silence persisting into Thursday. Anxious, she reached out to his workplace, met with initial reluctance, 
until disclosing her relationship with Nicholas. The revelation prompted cooperation from the receptionist, who reluctantly divulged information regarding Nicholas's whereabouts. Nicholas has been hospitalized since Tuesday night, the receptionist informed Mandeline over the phone, detailing a violent altercation near his beloved sports bar that left him severely injured. Shocked and alarmed, Mandeline hurried to the hospital, her heart pounding with worry. As she gazed at Nicholas's battered face, questions tumbled from her lips, demanding answers for his science. Amidst his injuries, Nicholas recounted the events, revealing the brutality inflicted upon him by an unknown assailant. Anguish twisted in Madeline's chest as she struggled to comprehend the extent of his injuries, her mind racing with disbelief and concern. The realization that her ex-husband might be involved pierced her like a knife, casting doubt upon her perceptions and decisions. Nicholas's assertion of Brian's involvement ignited a tumult of emotions within Madeline, torn between defending her ex-husband's character and confronting the possibility of his culpability. Anger bubbled beneath the surface as she grappled with conflicting loyalties, grappling with the dissonance between the man she once loved and the accusations hurled against him. Despite her reservations, Madeline couldn't shake the gnawing guilt that gnawed at her, questioning her role in the unfolding tragedy. The sting of betrayal mingled with the ache of uncertainty, leaving her reeling in turmoil. In the midst of her anguish, she couldn't help but wonder if Brian's actions were driven by wounded pride or something far more sinister. Madeline's voice cracked with fury when Brian picked up the phone. Her words laced with accusation and desperation. Brian's calm response only fueled her anger, frustration mounting as she struggled to convey the severity of Nicholas's condition. Despite her impassioned plea, Brian's dismissive tone left her seething with resentment and helplessness. As the call ended, Madeline grappled with a mix of emotions, her heart heavy with the weight of betrayal and injustice. Brian's apparent innocence only deepened her sense of betrayal, a bitter irony twisting in her gut as she questioned how he could feign ignorance so convincingly. The truth hung heavy in the air, a bitter reminder of the complexities of their shared history. When the police arrived at Brian's doorstep, suspicion lingered in the air, casting a shadow over their fraught relationship. Brian's composed demeanor belie the turmoil brewing beneath the surface, his measured responses a testament to his resolve. Despite the lingering doubts, the police ultimately cleared Brian of any involvement in Nicholas's assault, offering a fleeting sense of relief amidst the chaos. In the quiet of the bar, Brian shared a moment of gratitude with his father-in-law, the weight of the ordeal lingering between them. Their shared bond offered solace amidst the uncertainty, a silent acknowledgement of the trials they had faced together. As they raised their glasses in a silent toast, Brian's quiet words carried a depth of emotion, a quiet testament to the resilience of their bond amidst the storm. Peter, Madeline's father began sullenly, you were such an obvious target that they just couldn't ignore you, but you don't owe me anything. I owe you this for what my stupid daughter did to you. You've been a good husband and a great father to my grandchildren. The weight of gratitude and regret hung heavy in his voice as he made the heartfelt admission. With a wry smile, Peter responded, I'll tell you what, from now on, you'll have to buy drinks. I can get used to this expensive drink. The clinking of glasses echoed their shared camaraderie as they savored the amber liquid, a silent acknowledgement of their enduring bond. Two months after Nicholas's attack, Madeleine found herself craving intimacy more than ever. The absence of bedtime love left her longing and desperate, driving her to seek solace in the arms of another man. Though it wasn't love she sought, the physical closeness offered a temporary reprieve from her ache. Despite their strained relationship since the attack, Madeline hesitated to discuss her needs with Nicholas. Instead, she sought comfort in the arms of Stuart Fox, a man almost as imposing as Nicholas, but with a gentler demeanor. That chance encounter at the local Starbucks had sparked a curiosity in Madeline, leading her to wonder if Stuart could fill the void left by her ex-husband in their new polyamorous trio. As Nicholas recovered, Stuart seamlessly assumed the role of Madeline's second husband, his presence offering a sense of stability in the midst of uncertainty. With each passing day, Madeline found herself drawn closer to Stuart, his warmth and sincerity gradually filling the void left by Nicholas's absence. 
Madeleine's rendezvous with her second beau occurred twice a week, a delicate dance orchestrated around her parental duties. With the children old enough to manage on their own for a few hours, Madeleine slipped away on Wednesday evenings and Saturday mornings, much like she did when married to Brian. Keeping Stuart at arm's length from Nicholas was crucial, at least until fate intervened and Nicholas discovered the truth. Their lives, once intertwined, now only intersected during custodial handovers and sporadic school events. Brian's demeanor remained polite, while Madeline persistently attempted to thaw the frost of their fractured relationship. Yet, it was the children who unwittingly unveiled Madeline's return to polyamory, a revelation that sent ripples through the family dynamic. Dominic and Matilda, innocently unaware of the turmoil their words incited, casually reveal their mother's absences on Saturday mornings, attributing it to her gym routine. Brian, grappling with the gravity of their mother's choices, urged them to maintain respect despite their hurt. Dominic's blunt assessment of Madeline's actions as family destructive resonated deeply with Brian, prompting him to ponder the repercussions. The revelation that Madeline was still feeding the children misinformation about her whereabouts piqued Brian's curiosity. He had shielded them from the specifics of their mother's infidelity, yet Madeline's persistence in concealing her true activities sparked a need for transparency. Brian resolved to address the issue when Madeline next had custody of the children, determined to shed light on the shadows of their fractured family. He borrowed a friend's car and parked discreetly a block away from Madeline's residence, armed with two Dunkin' Donuts and a cup of coffee. Drenched in thoughts of her morning with Stuart, Madeline remained oblivious to being tailed. Brian's smile widened as he observed Madeline pull up in front of a duplex. Jotting down the address between bites of his second Bavarian cream donut, Brian glanced up in time to witness a burly young man, clad only in sports shorts, greet Madeline with a tender kiss at the door. She's got a thing for big young guys, Brian muttered aloud, observing the scene. With a few taps on his phone, Brian swiftly unearthed the young man's name and chuckled with satisfaction. Thanks, Google, he quipped. Nicholas Gibbs, unfamiliar with the incoming call, answered confidently. How can I help you? He replied, masking his annoyance. Brian, withholding his identity, wasted no time. You can't help me, but I can help you, he stated bluntly. Nicholas, bristling with hostility, retorted. What do you want, you bastard? Brian remained unfazed. Isn't it a bit late for apologies? Nicholas snarled. Brian countered, I have no reason to apologize to you, but out of self-interest, I'll do you a favor you don't deserve. Brian teased Nicholas with cryptic details. Do you know where your favorite girl is now? Let me enlighten you. She's with the young one, but not yours. Nicholas's tone grew more hostile. She definitely has her type. Brian chuckled, relishing the moment. Nicholas demanded to know the identity of this bastard. Brian, reveling in his newfound power, divulged the information. According to Google, he's Stuart Fox, residing at 1735 William Street. The rest, you'll have to figure out yourself. Brian witnessed Madeline Bailey stepping into Nicholas's house on Monday after work when he confronted her, but not physically. What the hell, Madeline? Nicholas's voice echoed. How long has this been going on? Madeleine smirked in response. I've already told you I'll never share you. A bit hypocritical of you, don't you think? It was fine for you to meddle in my marriage with my husband, but now that you're my number one, you don't want anyone interfering in your marriage, she retorted. We've been together for months now. It started when you were incapacitated. I have feelings for him, just like I do for you. If your husband the one truly married to you left you over this. Why do you expect me to stay? Nicholas questioned. It's such disrespect. Madeline screamed. But you love me. You said you loved me. Nicholas's response was blunt, probably not enough. Two weeks later, Nicholas found himself in his office restroom, knees buckling from searing pain emanating from his organ. Nothing screams love more than a venereal disease, he growled zipping up. He staggered back to his office, urgently called the doctor, claiming an emergency. The doctor, taking pity, promptly prescribed treatment after administering an injection. 
The nurse returned with a notebook and pen, requesting the names and phone numbers of all the partners Nicholas had in the last two months. He hesitated, then reluctantly offered only one name, Madeline Kennedy. Do you know if she had anyone else besides you during the same time? The nurse asked quietly. Nicholas blushed before responding. Yes, she has another boyfriend, Stuart Fox, and there's a possibility she's still involved with her ex-husband, Brian. I'm not certain, Nicholas admitted. Madeline's stomach churned when she received a call from the county medical center the next day. Dan, this idiot, was intimate with someone else, breaking the rules and clearly without protection. Nicholas is going to be furious, she thought to herself. Feeling embarrassed, Madeline had to disclose the names of both her lovers to the nurse on the other end of the line, as required by law. Are you sure there were no others? The nurse asked again, a tad too complacently for Madeline's liking. I'm certain Madeline began, then realized how it might appear to a nurse simply doing her job. No one else. The following day, Nicholas called Brian Kennedy, ostensibly to return a favor Brian had done him weeks earlier. Hey buddy, I just thought you should know in case you need to see a doctor too. I tested positive for gonorrhea. Madeline is my only partner, so I know it's from her. You're not involved with her anymore, are you? Nicholas asked cautiously. No way, Brian responded, contempt evident in his voice. After six years of being a bachelor, Brian was certain he'd never marry again. Satisfied with his life, he had no interest in a relationship. After his regular Friday workout at the local YMCA, Brian stopped at a vending machine to grab a Gatorade, a drink for athletes. The woman ahead of him at the vending machine seemed oblivious to his presence, as if time was no concern of hers. After a subtle cough to get her attention, she startled and turned towards him. With a quick once-over, Brian noted her Asian features and long, sleek black hair tied neatly in a ponytail. She sported what Brian considered cute workout attire, a snub burgundy top and matching yoga pants. He mumbled to himself, very few can pull off yoga pants, but she's definitely one of them. The woman beamed at him, her warm brown eyes reflecting her smile. Wow, slick opening line. Did you find that one in how to charm women for dummies? He teased. Taken aback, Brian raised his hands in surrender. The last thing he expected was a witty retort from a 40-year-old soccer mom. Unkidding, just joking, she quickly apologized, realizing Brian wasn't trying to hit on her. It always seems to happen around this vending machine, she added. In that moment, Brian's brain caught up with reality. He enjoyed bantering with an attractive woman as much as any other guy. Gotcha, he replied with a grin. Ah, the old stupid guy routine always seems to do the trick with smart women, he remarked, prompting a slight smile from her. All right, let's say I buy that, she chuckled. I'm Mary, and you're Brian Kennedy. I'd appreciate it if you made your choice quickly, because I really need my Gatorade, he said with a grin. A year later, they exchanged vows in an intimate ceremony. Brian was enamored by Mary's sharp intellect, witty banter, and her agile physique. He discovered she was actually 49, not 40 as he initially assumed, and that she had divorced her unfaithful husband about seven years prior. Their conversations revealed they shared similar values. I don't do sharing when it comes to my man. Ever. Is that clear? Mary stated firmly and added, you're my one and only love, and it should be mutual. Thanks for listening to my story. Post a comment and watch other videos.